Today we have a public lecture on what is good practice research by Professor Ian Shaw. He is our SR Naden professor for this year and he is also the Emeritus Professor at the University of York. Right. Um, he has worked on a lot of quantitative, uh, qualitative research as well as evaluative methodology, practitioner research and practice and research relationship. And he is most suited to share with you the in-depth of what is happening in practice research. Okay, so today the session will begin with um, Professor Yen Shaw's lecture and we will have a break in between at about 4.30 and after the half an hour break, we'll come back here for question and answer. So without further ado, may I invite Professor Shaw. Okay, um, I think we can uh, start again. And uh, I was here last year and uh, gave a, a, a lecture and I was asked to say something about practice research that year, so that time. So if any of you were here then, I, I'm sorry, I cannot think of 100% um, different things to say this year than I said last year. But um, today I, I want to approach it in a rather different way. And I want to bear in mind that we're here because of this very interesting and valuable um, development of a research relationship between social work agencies here in Singapore and the, um, and the university. And I want us to try together to think about what questions are especially relevant to think about at this stage of the development of this project and of this relationship. So let's think a little bit to begin with. Um, where and when did this idea of practice research emerge? Well, of course, in one way, it's always been around. In any professional field, whether it's education or healthcare, law, social work, counselling, and so on, um, it, even in fields like pharmacy and the probation service, working with offenders, but, um, the question of the special character of research in that particular field always arises and whether it is in some special way practice related and and to ask in what way it is distinctive and different from uh, disciplines that are not driven by an immediate applied purpose large parts of psychology or sociology um, for example but the phrase practice research started to be used quite a lot about um, 10 years ago. Um, I think independently, um, as far as I can work out, in two places. Um, in, in Finland, a very strong um, social work research unit in the capital, Helsinki, um, started to speak of their research in this way when they were um, trying to develop recognition um, by the government. They were trying to think of a way of talking about the research that went on in the field of social work that would attract government support and funding. And then um, shortly after that, a small conference was organized in England by Jan Fook, then at the University of Southampton. She'd shortly come to the UK from Australia. And about 25 people were invited. I was along with them. And a statement was published. It's always referred to as the Salisbury Statement and uh, you can see that statement and then since then there have been further conferences and further statements have been issued from those conferences. There was the Helsinki Statement in 2012 and then two years later uh, the New York Statement about practice research. And of course there was a conference in Hong Kong earlier this year in May and uh, I guess we may yet see the 2017 Hong Kong statement on practice research. Well, I'm sure you're relieved that I don't plan to take you line, through, line by line through all of these practice statements. But I do think it would be a value for someone involved um, with the initiative here to read through and think through those statements and to see how the idea has developed, to see whether it's changed or grown in some way in the last few years. And also 
and that would allow you to connect your work here to these wider developments. But my approach is going to be rather different. Uh, as I've said, I want to suggest what I think will be the questions that your university agency partnership and initiative is likely to raise. And there will be a cautionary strand or element in what I say. Um, I'll say something about what are the risks, the challenges that are most likely to be missed, to be overlooked, the dangers that may creep upon you without warning. So I'm trying to lay the groundwork for social workers becoming, as I put it here, more thoughtfully practical and practically thoughtful. Well, what is practice research? Uh, the writers of the Salisbury Statement said this, there is no definite consensus on the meaning of the term practice research and other related terms, for example, practitioner research, are often used instead. Um, I asked uh, one of my uh, recent colleagues uh, in Denmark, I, I worked part-time in Denmark um, for a few years, um, who, uh, Lars, who writes, uh, uh, is one of the more helpful contributors to this field. And uh, I wrote to him a few days ago, he said, we need to be better in explaining what practice research is. We've tried to avoid a more specific definition as we wanted to be open to new ideas and experiences. But I think we need to work toward a definition or some definitions. Uh, well, I'm not altogether sure about that. What is practice research in Singapore? That may sound like a compromise, uh, but I suggest there are some dangers in developing or choosing one particular definition and we'll see that as we work through um, this afternoon. Yes, you should think through just what are the kinds of practice related re inquiry and action that you want to undertake here. Leaving it open ended may just make it fragmented, but you don't have to think you have to do everything here that has been included and in the um, definition and description of practice research everywhere. I'm not advising you to go it alone. I have said uh, you should know what the field includes, read the statements and decide where your interests belong within that field. Well, why do I say that? Well, for one or two reasons. First, these statements have been written mainly by academic faculty, not by practitioners. And one of their concerns in writing these statements, as I mentioned earlier when talking about Finland, a perfectly proper and correct concern is to try to gain recognition for social work research in an academic community within a university which sometimes is skeptical of the value of social work research. A friend told me this when I was preparing this lecture. My PhD student just came back from a research seminar arranged by sociology and they questioned social work research all the way through the seminar and named the student the social worker, the practitioner, instead of the PhD student. The second, I think even more important reason, is that there is, I believe, considerable diversity within practice research. And while there is good and bad practice research, just because it's practice research doesn't mean it's good, just as there is good and bad academic research, but we shouldn't set up a hierarchy or, and say there are certain kinds of practice research which are the ones that really count and that they come above other kinds. And I think this diversity that is important to think about in developing this kind of relationship between the university and the agencies are of three kinds. First, um, that practice research may be um, practice-led, practitioner-led, I probably should say, or partnership with academics. Secondly, uh, you can have practice research projects which are standalone, just a single um, piece of work, or which take place over 
a period of time, over a period of stages. That difference is important. And then thirdly, you can have projects which are freestanding. They may be standalone or over a period of time, but they're, they're freestanding or they're part of a wider network of practice research projects. And as we work our way through these, which I'm going to now, you'll see that I don't think any of these should be treated as choices, that you have to go for one uh, rather than the other. So let's have a look at this first one, practitioner-led and academic partnership. And uh, this is something I did talk about last year um, in relation to practitioner research with a, a colleague, uh, Neil Luntz. We have undertaken a review of practitioner research in the social care field with adults in the UK uh, just three or four years ago. And uh, we analyzed uh, these um, studies uh, looking at various dimensions uh, which I refer to there um, on the slide. And as we did so, we became increasingly aware of the difficulties of generalizing regarding the character of practitioner research. And we ended up concluding that it, there are two significantly different kinds of practitioner research. In what ways did these practitioner-led and academic partnership um, uh, practice, practitioner research studies differ? Well, in quite a few ways. Um, the occupational roles of the researchers were rather different. Um, the kinds of working relationships between researchers. The research questions and problems that got focused on were rather different, whether when it was practitioner-led and when they were in partnership with academics. The kinds of research methods employed were rather different. The extent to which questions about the benefits and the uses of the research were directly addressed varied quite a lot. And the way in which the reports or articles were written varied a lot too. Well, which of these um, half a dozen differences are particularly important this afternoon? I think especially these three that are there in red, and I'm just going to run through those. Um, um, I'm not saying that the other issues are irrelevant, um, so I'm not saying that questions about research methods and utilization and the problems are not, not relevant. They most certainly are relevant. I'm simply saying at this point that it's these three which are relevant to understanding the nature of the likely differences between practitioner-led and partnership studies, as I guess they may develop here um, in Singapore. Now, practitioner-led studies, these were carried out by people largely working in social work agencies, community-based social care agencies, with few in academic posts. The partnership studies, um, there was very often a stronger health connection to these studies, and more often informed by an established culture of thinking about audit and accountability. And researchers were more likely to be drawn from clinical fields. Um, and quite a number, 30 of them, uh, were also in associated um, academic posts. Now, uh, this may not all apply to, in a direct way to you, but I do think there will be and ought to be a variety in the kind of occupational roles that are drawn to different kinds of partnership with university colleagues. Working relationships in these projects well, the practitioner-led studies, well, they were primarily under the control of the practitioner-researcher, often working alone. And in cases where academics also were involved, uh, it appeared to reflect arrangements where the practitioner or practitioners took a clear lead. It was quite definitely their project. And the role of academics was rather like that of support and resource. In the partnership studies, a typical pattern was of a very small team that 
included and indeed sometimes was led by academic researchers. And the person or people having a primarily practice identity and didn't always hold the lead in these studies. It was very much a practice research and they were central to the team, but it was a different kind of working relationship. Um, th there are some kinds of occupational roles, of course, and this again applies particularly um, in the health field, where people may hold roles that cross traditional practice and academic boundaries. Uh, that may happen particularly in the more clinical health fields and that uh, doesn't um, uh, so much apply the differences that I've talked about. Now again, this variation is a quite natural one. But it will be vital, I think, that expectations about working relationships in such projects are agreed clearly before embarking on such projects. And then, um, what kind of output um, it might be expected, and how should it be written? Well, the question about whether you want to publish anything in any format from such studies is a decision in itself, and that assumes what kind of audience are um, you going to be working for. Um, partnership projects um, are more likely to lead to people wanting to write for outside audiences. And this is a, a topic where, again, disagreement through unresolved expectations is more likely to occur. Should we write? How should we write? Who for? Who does the writing? I know that part of the central aim of this partnership is that these studies might produce materials that can be of value for teaching and for training. And to produce materials from such projects for training, if that can be achieved, it will be quite demanding, I'm quite sure, but it's well worth trying. And then I talked about standalone or projects over different stages. That's the second way in which they might differ. It's a question about how big and how long a, a given practice research project might last. And I raise it because um, it generally it seems to be assumed that practice research projects will be one-off projects, even if they are linked in a network that I'll talk about um, in a moment. But I think that, um, that uh, stage projects um, that some practice research may be better approached over two or more stages. One reason for this is pragmatic, especially in the case of solo um, practitioner-led projects, because they're demanding. They're very demanding. And staging the work can make something feasible which may not be feasible otherwise. So I would advise that if you do that, that you try to make the outputs from each stage to be something of practice value, just in case the whole series of stages doesn't finally get delivered. But there's also a whole set of questions and problems that are better dealt with over time rather than just as a kind of simple cross-section at one moment in time. So when there are kinds of issues and and that take quite a long time to unfold. When something happens only very occasionally. When we're interested in understanding the way something or somebody changes over time. So think about that too. Don't just go for single kind of one-off standalone projects. Think about the possibility of having projects over stages. And then, finally, thirdly, freestanding or networked projects. So um, the projects we've talked about so far um, are freestanding in the sense of not being part of any wider set of projects. But one helpful development in the last decade has been network projects. Examples can be found in uh, these four countries of some quite interesting such networks of projects. The basic idea is this, a group of 
simultaneously, often modestly funded, mentored, moderated projects where within a shared overall general theme, um, each particular project has its own topic, often with network meetings. That's an interesting development and I think a very helpful um, way um, that has come out. I think there are these gains. But it is, of course, more resource hungry. Um, and it can, again, raise difficulties of ownership. It's a point you'll see I'm beginning to make in a recurring way. Who owns these projects? Now, I haven't said anything about traditional university-led projects that focus on either understanding or try to evaluate social work practice. That is, a, of course, a kind of practice research, but um, it, it may be that that's not the added value that this particular funded initiative may give. Well, where have we got to? Let's recap some of the questions this leaves us with. This is not in any special order. So here you are. So should publication be a goal? If so, in what form? Um, who owns the results? What kinds of problem should these studies address? Is research training of some kind needed? How should priorities be set? Who decides what matters? What should come first? What is most important? How do you balance a collective agenda for the project as a whole and the interests of individual practitioners and participants? How should questions of research ethics be dealt with? And how should practice research relate to and enable service user concerns? It says just here uh, on the chart here um, that um, service users will be involved in the studies from conceptualization right through to utilization. That is a very stringent and demanding standard that you collectively have set yourselves. How should that work out? Um, I just want to say a little bit about that particular point. When I spoke to Lars, I asked him what did he think were the big questions facing practice research? He'd give me a list, you can tell. The third thing I'd like to mention, he said, is to get much more experience in involving service users in the process. We have very little experience in this. Um, and then he refers to a British, um, very, in Britain, very well-known um, researcher who has worked in this field for many years. We do have Peter Beresford's discussions and experiences. If you Google Peter Beresford, you'll see a great deal about this. But this is a specific angle and a UK angle. We need more global experiences in this area. Well, how might practitioner priorities compare with service users' user priorities? Uh, quite a few years ago, in the bottom right-hand corner, I was involved um, with a, um, an NGO in, in, in the UK, the Mental Health Foundation which funded a national UK-wide project called Strategies for Living, in which they invited mental health service users to bid for grants for funding uh, for somewhere around 5,000 Singapore dollars, but that was 10 years ago, so it was worth a bit more then. Um, and, uh, uh, and at a, a big national meeting in, in Birmingham, in the centre of England, of all of these projects, the service users all talked about what were they interested in. These were the issues in capitals that they were interested in. I'm not going to read them through. But at the same time, I was doing one of my studies of practitioner research. And I compared the topics the practitioners were studying with the topics the service users were studying. They were very different. Very different indeed. The practitioner is much more concerned with evaluating a service. Is a service working? The service users, you will see, 
much more directly focused on how they saw the world and what they felt they needed and wanted. So this indicates that collaboration that we were just talking about, valuable as it is, is not straightforward. It needs real hard work. Well, I want to spend uh, the rest of the time um, in um, this lecture um, uh, uh, saying something about what I call here the trials and joys of doing practice research as a practitioner. Now again, I spoke about this last year, but I think the evidence really is important. I'm talking here about social work practitioners who were doing stand-alone projects, they were not staged, and they were doing it as part of a funded network in a national children's agency in Scotland. Now, I know this will not generalize to all the kinds of practice research that we've talked about already this afternoon. It's this particular quite common kind of practice research, standalone projects, part of a funded network, but all in one big national agency. And, uh, but we have very little evidence about what the experience of doing um, practice research feels like to practitioners. So I want to go through um, something that came out of a, a study, another study, again, that Neil Lunt and I um, did in um, Scotland. So, as I say there, I want to encourage interested practitioners, but I want to forewarn and caution and prepare as well. Okay. Um, how should we think about this question of the experience of practice research? Well, it is helpful to distinguish two broadly different kinds of questions. The first kind of question of questions are those questions that occur step by step while the project is going on. There are different kinds of questions that will face uh, people in an early stage of a project than face people later on. That kind of linear idea of different questions over time. But then there are other kinds of issues which cut across all stages of practice research. And I want to talk a little bit about both of those. I'll say a little bit more about the second kind of question um, than the first. So and that's where we're going to go in um, the uh, remainder of this lecture. For example, what predisposes people to become engaged in practice research? It's not a straightforward question we discovered. Secondly, what initial understanding are people likely to bring with them to their involvement? And how might this understanding change and move during their projects? Thirdly, what are the push and pull factors that lead down pathways to particular research topics, choices of research topics? How do people get drawn towards something or pushed away? How does the institutionally, how does that work? And then fourthly, um, how does the interplay, the interrelationship between agency managers, um, other people who are part of a network of projects, that's what I mean by cohort colleagues, um, practice colleagues who are not involved 
in practice research, but with whom you may work day by day. University faculty and support tutors. How does that, all of that mixture, how does that help to either support, encourage, sometimes discourage, focus, shape, sustain, direct, redirect projects? How does all that seem to work? Then the horizontal factors. I'll come back and say a little bit more about each of these factors um, in a minute. First, um, I, I will repeat these because these are, in a sense, rather more complex, I think. First, it seemed to us that practice researchers, practitioners as practice researchers remember, I'm always talking about in this part of the lecture, practice researchers engage with a language and a culture that is strange and yet potentially rewarding for both their practice and research. They find themselves located in a culture that lies somewhere between practice and research, but is fundamentally shaped by and in turn challenges both of them. Secondly, Practice researchers are typically engaged in negotiating a world that they don't feel entirely certain about. It's new to them. They may have done a small research project of some kind when on a qualifying social work program or master's program, but nonetheless, this kind of project comes as something new to them. And at, at its heart, we see people making an effort to learn what it's about. Thirdly, um, the location of practice research as lying both inside the core of their professional work, of your professional work, and yet in some senses outside of it at the same time, being both an insider and an outsider, presents difficult challenges of moral accountability within your practice culture. Fourthly, um, involvement in practice research for most people stirs reflection on the meaning and value of professional work in general. For some practitioners, this may seem to be too demanding um, in the context of the con what a perceived to be the constraints of their everyday core work. And then, as I've said in a different connection already, networked and sponsored initiatives, sponsored funded initiatives, inevitably raise um, questions of ownership. I don't think the word sponsored is on the slides that you've had copied. I think I added that this morning, like I added the photograph. Um, and then, I think I would say this, it goes back to how do we define practice research. I think in an important sense, the nature of practice research is something that emerges from the doing of it, rather than being something which is defined and has boundaries set around it in advance. It's only in the doing of practice research that its critical identity in large part takes shape. Well, let's go back to some of these questions. Who will go for um, um, practice research? Well, it seemed to us that um, there are three elements to why people get involved. Motivation, capacity, and opportunity. I, I don't know whether there's anybody here um, apart from me, maybe, who remembers that many, many years ago there was a book published in the States called, a social work book called Motivation, Capacity and Opportunity. It seems to me a, a good way of, of bringing together these kind of concerns. But none of these is easy to anticipate. It does, um, th these are um, not their real names when I'm quoting, these are this was in Scotland, so we gave these people Scottish, good Scottish names. Um, and uh, so Jean said this, 
it does require the individuals to be hugely motivated, hugely proactive, really. And then Shona said, I want to make sure it's a good piece of work, so I will work really hard to do that. I won't just produce any old thing. That's how I feel. That's just about me, about my personality. That's motivation. Capacity. Well, I think there are um, different elements to this question about whether someone has capacity to do practice research, the role of academic support, uh, the nature of any already existing capacity that a person may have, and the question about um, capacity produced from related projects. So again, individual capacity may not be recognized in advance. Indeed, it will often be latent, waiting perhaps to be illuminated by the coming together of motivation and opportunity. Um, then this question about academic support was something which people found ambiguous. And I think we need to be clear about this when practitioners maybe uh, are gaining or either collaborating directly with or getting mentoring support from academics. And he here's just an extract from one interview conversation to illustrate um, how academic support may be rather ambiguous. Somebody said, one sad, for, one sad thing for me is I wanted to, I don't know whether to say it or if it is the place to say it, but I wanted to use the children as asking the questions to other children. And I really, really wanted that. I have been counseled out of it. Have you, said the interviewer, by your tutor? Yeah, I just had two wonderful, an eight and a nine year old, who I think could ask these questions. And really it was about confidentiality and how they would maintain confidentiality within the families. But I think it's a real pity. I'm not saying the rights and wrongs of that, that particular decision, but you can see that academic support here raise difficulties um, for this practitioner and that had lingered for quite some time. I think this conversation she was remembering had happened about 15 months previously because we were talking at the end of um, um, this one particular cohort of projects. Now, opportunities, again, are as much made as given. What may seem an opportunity to one person in an organization um, might be interpreted differently by someone with different interests. So again, what counts as an opportunity is difficult to see. That there's an element of unplanned good fortune here. And then where do topics come from? How do people pick on a topic? And again, we found that quite a number of the people we talked to had had in their head for a number of years what we refer to as practice puzzles. For practitioners, their research was often a, a lens that enabled them to focus on fairly major, but sometimes partly unrealized, that they hadn't quite thought them through in advance, but long contained career and life issues. There were one or two stories told to us, which we were asked not to repeat, not to report. They never went in the report, but they were quite moving stories of this kind. In a more straightforward example, someone said this, um, talking about how family plans work. I find plans are not followed by various groupings, so I wondered why that was, and was that something we could really work on? So irritation prompted me, really, but it was something that you could really use, and I think I really thought that too. I think that this weight of personal commitments, puzzles, investments, may be underestimated in organizational planning for setting up initiatives of this kind. Because it, it is difficult, the planning of a, a project like it, the one is starting here is not easy to plan. But it, because of that, it may be that the organizational decisions uh, are always to the foreground. And these kind of more personal investments um, gets left rather in the background.
Well, what happens when people are negotiating uh, um, these kind of issues? Um, well, practitioners uh, are often in a position that they feel rather weak. We saw that in that example about uh, the ambiguity of academic support. Um, it often entailed a process of focusing and downsizing. Again, the, the academics in this particular project may sometimes have treated in too routine a way. It, you often find academics will say, because they've had to say it many times, I don't think that's feasible, that's too ambitious, that's too big, you need to cut it down. But remembering that these are interests that practitioners will bring that matter to them, that cutting down can be quite a difficult experience. Here's um, an example, which again, I think is quite moving. Somebody we call Alison. She said, well, I had a topic in mind that would have been very difficult to do. And I don't know how you would have done it, but it is still an area that I'm interested in. So what was that? Well, I didn't tell them, but it was really about working with families where there is a paedophile living within the home or there's somebody who has abused a child living in the home and you didn't put that forward as an idea no i didn't no i, I just thought it would have been very complex and how would i do it and it was also about getting people's consent and i think it would have been quite difficult well it would have been quite difficult for sure Now, as in the last uh, 10 minutes, I want to say something about these, what I call horizontal aspects. Um, and uh, you'll see here I'm repeating um, the um, questions that, um, the points that I made earlier. First, that practice researchers engage with a language and culture that is strange and yet potentially rewarding. They're located in a culture which is be between practice and research. Alison. People speak in a different language. People use different words for different things. Shona. It's something that I haven't ever done before, so to be able to talk about it, undertaking a piece of research or a study in this way, I quite like that. I quite like to be learning new things, and we talked before about the language, the process, and that was all new to me and then being able to see it through. And I'm quite excited at this point in time about getting it written and completed. And that's about a sense of achievement for me. Secondly, that practice researchers are typically engaged in negotiating an uncertain world. Uh, Alison said uh, somewhere else, I tried to put as much wording in of, of what people had actually said. She's talking about writing the report at the end of the project. I tried to put as much wording in of what people had actually said because I thought that's what it's about. Now that seems a fairly straightforward thing for someone to say. But here you can actually hear somebody endeavouring to identify the essential nature of research. And beginning to think that's what it's actually about. Then in someone in a focus group comment. Uh, the bit I wonder about is, have you ever had a semi-structured interview and you go off on a tangent because it's interesting? Do you have to do the same with all of them? You have to remember the tangent and always go off on it. Because you could end up with five totally different interviews. So I'm a bit confused about that. Questions about difficult accountabilities. Uh, there are two words here. You see uh, the word skiving and swanning off and skiving and swanning off both have a sense of avoiding commitments retreating from commitments in a rather thoughtless way um, often uh, ha has the idea of um, when, when a, a, a child leaves the home and never gets to school and ends up somewhere else for the day swanning off i felt my colleagues that, that there was this kind of sense that i feel like i'm skiving so this person went to his or her team and she had this experience that the other people in the team who weren't doing these projects, when she went off to do this extra work for the project, she had this feeling that her projects felt that she was somehow not doing the work she should be doing. Uh, similar, um, they maybe thought I was swanning off for days to work from home and all the rest of it, 
somebody else said. We asked somebody, um, have there been advantages in taking part? It doesn't feel like it at the moment. It just feels like a millstone, to be honest. Uh, this particular person never uh, completed her project. And then questions of meaning and value. Uh, here's um, an exchange between four social workers. I, um, the, the agency is called Children First. That's the actual name of the agency. I think we've been lucky that Children First invested in doing it and gave us the opportunity to do it. We have, we have been lucky. I also think, despite my moaning, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. It's not something I regret doing. I'm so glad I did it. Yes, absolutely. In the main, it's been positive. Somebody who hasn't spoken so far. We focused on challenges and learning and things, but I would agree that, you know, looking back, I would do things differently, but I'm still glad I did it. A sense of uh, kind of reward um, that uh, many people felt. But for some... There was a sense of a project never finished. And the sense that the wider agency program had been brought to the foreground at the expense of their individual projects. Here are two examples. Somebody says in a focus group, I really wanted something for the kids who took part in that. You know, this wasn't really necessarily something for me, but it was more about the kind of process that they took part in. And that feels like that's kind of disappeared and that it's become something more corporate. Someone else. It's just, remembering this was an, a national agency right across Scotland, Edinburgh is the location of the office, the capital of Scotland, the head office. It's just I feel as if I've kind of gone in and done it and I go away to Edinburgh and I disappear every so often and do things like this. She means giving a talk about her research. And I come back, but you know, nobody's really aware of what I've done. And I kind of think that's a shame because it feels like it's been a major piece of work for me. For me. I look at and I think, I can't believe I actually did that. But it feels like it's disappeared into the air somehow. And then identities. The nature of practice research being something that emerges from the experience rather than something which is prescribed um, in advance. I don't want to overestimate this. It goes back to right to the beginning about giving a definition and so on. Gillian um, said this. Practice research can, she said, open up so many possibilities I had not thought of. She went on to say, I think what I am and what I would like to be are different That's as a result of doing this project. I'm a practitioner, that's my job, so that's what I have to do. I'm bound by the context of that because that's my income, that's my livelihood. I'd like to be more of a researcher. It's opened up a whole range of things that I've never done before, so I'd like to pursue maybe ways of combining the two. Here's somebody raising a quite complex idea. I don't want to go to the university and turn myself into a researcher, but I'm no longer quite just a practitioner anymore either. I'm something else. And what I am and what I'd like to be are different. Well, in closing, just one or two recommendations which won't surprise you. I've made or implied quite a lot already. We should commit ourselves to an understanding of practice research that doesn't set it within a deficit model so that we see practice research um, as a rudimentary or thin version of academic research, as some people do. And some kinds of practice research do lie in an interesting position somewhere between research and practice. A final word from Lars. I just call him Lars. I can never pronounce his family name. Uyaha. <laughs> Uyaha. I believe is how he pronounces it. He, he said this. Uh, he was a colleague for three years as well. And uh, yeah, some of you might have met him. He gave one of the big presentations at the Hong Kong um, conference. Um, yes, it was the one where his colleague, if you were there, his colleague uh, um, had a bereavement and couldn't come. And his colleague was speaking um, uh, on a recorded message 
and, and uh, Lars was doing the response. There's no shaking of the head, so obviously nobody saw it. Um, he said, I think this is a challenge for practice research, both for practice researchers, sorry about the typo, uh, to be sure, um, that this approach meets the criteria for qualified research, but also how to convince the rest of the research world that this is an acceptable and qualified research approach and not research light. And then, practice research should not be seen as a single homogenous form of doing inquiry. We should resist straightforward distinctions of seeing um, naive or mature research, simple or complex, and even practitioner-led versus partnership. We shouldn't overdo these um, distinctions. We should value a range of kinds of studies and the methodological diversity too. That places demands on the practice researchers as well too. Um, social workers, when they do get involved in research, do tend to automatically think, I will do a certain number, a rather small number of interviews, and I may do a focus group, and that's how you always do research. That's not how you always do research. And one strand of practice research should, I think, take place through various kinds of networks. And good practice research should endeavor to address issues of both local application and wider interest. And appropriate, uh, italicized, dissemination and utilization plans should be worked out. And it should enable appropriate forms of written product. Uh, I've said there on that final slide, um, if you do want to see more about three different research projects on this theme that I've been involved, you um, can look at that link. And I'm quite happy for you, anybody, to email me at my NUS email here. I'm here to the end of June, so you have to email me before the end of June. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shaw. Um, we now have a refreshment break for half an hour. Please uh, come back in 30 minutes um, and enjoy catching up with each other. See ya. It's two minutes earlier, but I think we can start so that we can start our weekend earlier too. <laughs> yeah, I hope you have a good break, um, tea break. Um, and uh, and I, I believe you will also agree with me that Prof. Chaw's lecture was really thought-provoking. I had the privilege of reading his PowerPoint. Oops, it starts again. Um, before the lecture, and I was like, really stimulated uh, because it makes me think of uh, many dimensions that uh, I, I didn't think of before. So uh, in order to make fruitful use of the little time that we have, 30 minutes, uh, I have two suggestions. First, um, if you have questions pertaining to the technical aspect of the Lee Chun Guan Endowed Fund uh, for practice research, uh, we suggest that you write to the Secretariat. I think the Secretariat's email is on the banner, right? Or if not, you can always go to the department's website. Uh, uh, under the tab Lee Chun Guan, you can see the Secretariat's uh, email address. So to ask technical issues regarding the grant by writing us emails, and uh, so for the questions to uh, be related to what Prof. Chow, uh talked about just now or um, stimulated by Prof. Chow's uh, lecture just now. And uh, the second suggestion is that we will take several questions in a row so that uh, Prof. Chow will be able to uh, address them maybe together collectively and we can save time on that too. Right, so uh, without delay, uh, may I invite you to first introduce yourself and if you work for uh, any organization to mention your employer too. Uh, I think there are mic runners there, right? Uh, yeah, if you can just raise your hand, the mic uh, will come to you. So people will take a while to warm up, right? Oh, yes, yes. This, this lady right in the center. Hello, um, I'm Anita. I'm from AWA. 
Um, just now, actually, I have a brief um, uh, talk with um, Prof. Chaw. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned about like how do we strike a balance between practice and research. Um, for me, because you know, I have, have been a practitioner for many years, but uh, lately, you know, I got into uh, research. So um, I mentioned about like one of my experience um, when I uh, worked with uh, uh, a researcher on the program evaluation, and uh, I was suggested a, a, a many you know a measurement tool to measure you know the the uh, outcome you know of you know the clients. So that sets of tools almost required uh, one and a half hours to complete, and it has to be administered every six months. Yeah. So of course, you know, as a practitioner, we know that clients, firstly, clients won't want you know to spend so much time. And is it necessary? Also, I mean, the second question is, we will wonder whether is it necessary to administer such you know uh, uh, many sets you know of um, uh, measuring tool. Is it you know um, purely more for academic knowledge or is for you know um, uh, practice knowledge but of course you know um, I study research and I have done research you know then if I take on you know uh, another head you know which is you know, the head of a researcher I can understand that uh, the reason why um, uh, uh, it's, it was you know, suggested so my question is like how to strike a balance between practice and research yeah, yeah. thank you Anita um, maybe next question, if your question is related. If it's not related, it's totally fine too. We just want to take a few questions in a row. Ah, right, right at the back. Um, um. I'm just wondering if there's a difference between um, practitioners who engage in uh, practice research and practitioners who don't, are there uh, differences in the outcomes of their cases in, in terms of their case management and in terms of their, um, because a motivation plays a part in uh, uh, being involved in research. So uh, is there a difference uh, between practitioners who participate in research and practitioners who don't? Uh, Thank you. Can we have your name? My name is Stacy. Cici. Stacy. Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. And the last question before Professor takes the three of them together. There's one hand here. Hi, my name is Denise. I'm a researcher from the Singapore Children's Society. I think you mentioned um, establishing appropriate dissemination and utilization ends uh, for the research projects uh, and the findings. Uh, could you give some suggestions as to what would be appropriate um, dissemination and utilization plans for a piece of practice research? And also, um, the second question would be, where, how and when do we decide whether or not to publish a piece of practice research? Thank you, Denise. Thank you. So these three questions first. Well, thank you for three so easy questions. <laughs> Um, the balance of practice and research is, um, it is a difficult one. It, it's um, connected, I think, with, the, with, the, with Stacey's question about um, differences between people who get involved and who don't get involved. Because inevitably, I think some of the um, qualities in a project that make it succeed um, inevitably are personal qualities. Um, you remember that slide I gave about motivation, capacity, and opportunity? And, um, and the way in which um, it seemed important to the people we, we talked to and spent time with that I think most of them recognized that they were dealing with something which was important to them and knew it would cost something to do so. Now, I, I am not saying, of course, 
um, that um, this means that um, practitioners who become involved in practice research projects should simply um, carry all of the personal cost um, that the investment means. That is certainly not true. I'm just saying that I think there are some personal differences which relate to, as I was saying when I was giving the lecture, trying to deal with perhaps long-held senses of issues and puzzles and problems. That it seems that the practice research gives them an opportunity to step back from day-to-day -day practice and to get a certain degree of distance so that although practi practice researchers, practitioners who are practice researchers, although they are of course in one sense much closer to practice than say somebody from the department here at the university who engages in a similar project, nonetheless because they're, as we, as I said several times, because for many it involves ending up somewhere slightly detached from both practice and from research, um, that that kind of distance is something which um, is something which individual people bring. But I would say in addition um, that the question of the balance of practice and research will in some cases require um, quite explicit recognition by agencies um, that um, their practitioners are engaged in something which is not possible simply to add on to all else that they do as part of their day-to-day -day work. And it will need some kind of management commitment. <coughs> and it will need, of course, a certain degree of recognition within a team uh, as well. I talked a bit about some of the difficulties that arose for some of the practice researchers we talked to where members of their own team felt that um, somehow the practice researchers were escaping from their proper obligations and were somehow having it easy when of course in fact they were having it more difficult. So there has to be that kind of recognition and that does need some degree of um, investment by agency management at a relatively senior level and it needs some kind of understanding by team leaders and um, people who are more closely um, um, in touch with the practitioner in a day-to-day -day way. Um, <coughs> so um, th there is one other thing that occurred to me when, when um, uh, you, you were talking, Anita, when you talked about using a, um, a measurement tool to... to yes, yes, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, uh, um, there is, I think, a particular issue if um, practice researchers are using methods of collecting data which they themselves did not develop. Because that always means that although it may be your project there is a sense in which you're doing it on someone else's behalf and I think that it really is something that needs careful thought um, it, it, it's not an easy question I'm not saying for instance that every time a practitioner gets involved with practice research that they should go always and develop their own measurement devices or interview schedules or observation um, um, schedules or so on. We have to learn from what others have done. But there is a difficulty, um, I think, when y you are committed to um, implementing a way of collecting data which may not have been exactly how you yourself uh, would have wished to have carried out the data collection. Um, so. I'm just recognizing a difficulty, I'm not solving it. Um, it j j on the question, um, Stacy, about the difference between practitioners who do and who do get involved, I've touched on it a bit in what I've just been saying, as you'll realize. Um, I think there, there are um, 
Um, there are personal differences, um, and uh, uh, which I, I won't repeat, but I, I, I've just referred to them. Um, but the one thing I would say, which uh, in, in this project in Scotland, which was a, a really quite fascinating project in which we felt we learnt a great deal ourselves, and that was the unpredictability of who got involved and who didn't. It, it was partly, remember I, I said that um, whether someone um, has the capacity to do something, um, people may not know clearly in advance that they do or they don't have the capacity um, to take it on. And it needs the kind of exploration. So I, I think what I would say in practical terms, that this is not a decision that should be rushed. So if you think you might like to be involved, uh, um, then um, don't rush into that decision. Talk to people, talk to your friends that you work with. Um, if, you, if you think you, there is maybe somebody at the university you'd like to have a conversation with without any um, strings attached to it, as we say, um, then ask for that. Don't rush into it. Um, I don't know whether you remember there was one person, I think I myself did the interview, we call her, what did we call her? Leslie, I think. Um, where, where the project turned out just to be a terrible burden and she felt a, a guilty responsibility that she'd committed herself to doing it and she couldn't escape. She had um, family issues that had arisen that hadn't been anticipated at the time when she took it on. Um, and uh, so I, I think that um, e even if some of you are really enthusiastic and think this is certainly something I really do want to do, um, then think it through. Um, talk to people and don't, don't rush into it. Um, that, that's the advice I, I, I would give. Now, that's a, not a complete answer. I don't think there is an answer that I can say, oh, th these are the kinds of people that do get involved, these are the kinds of people that don't. Um, I, I don't think that's possible to say. And then, um, I think it was um, Denise, could I, could I suggest a um, dissemination plan or utilisa utilisation plan? Um, um, I would say generally, and I'm now talking about academic research, I think that research utilization is a difficult issue that is not always well thought through in academic research. I don't think I've always thought it through properly. One thing I would say though is it is crucially different, so it's crucially important to recognize the difference between disseminating and utilizing. Uh, too often um, people think, well, uh, um, uh, here are some practical implications from this research. We'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, send, we'll do a presentation or, or we'll send a memo around to everybody. We'll make sure it's disseminated around everybody. Uh, so that, that's all you need to do. Um, dissemination and utilization are quite different things. And the implications of any research, the practice implications of any research, whoever's done it, whatever kind it is, are never always obvious. So I think it, I did say um, that it is important to think through this issue in advance. But I think the kinds of things that are important to think through is that um, if you're doing a, a study which you know is going to say something, for example, about how a particular kind of intervention is organized in your agency, um, then you do need, um, and everybody needs in advance, um, to recognize that this is, this is a project which is going to raise questions about possible changes that might need uh, to be made. And uh, I think that, that again is an agency-wide um, decision uh, and recognition that needs, needs to be made. Um, if, if someone goes into a, a very good piece of research 
And at the end, um, there is not this investment, this acceptance by the other stakeholders that this may have implications for what we do. Um, then the, the only result is going to be disappointment. It, it's a little bit like um, that rather sad quotation I gave of somebody who said, well, I just go up to Edinburgh and I talk about it. And um, I, I come back, but it feels like I, I've never done it. It feels like it's just disappeared in the air. But it was something that meant a great deal to me. Well, it seemed to me that that was partly a question about utilization. Here was somebody who'd done something which um, was, as far as we could tell, a genuinely interesting piece of work. Um, but it hadn't been probably thought through in advance that this would involve a commitment not just by that one person, but by the at least the immediate circle of colleagues. The three simple questions took us 17 minutes. <laughs> so uh, we... There was a question about should you publish or not. Um, and and um, um, I uh, think it will depend what kind of project. If it's a partnership project, then that is probably going to lead to expectations to some kind of publication. If it's a practitioner-led, it may not. And if it is for this particular project, then do remember what it says, that one of the primary aims is that it should produce materials that can be of helpful, helpful in training and in teaching. Um, and this may well not mean something which goes into a, a social work journal. Um, but it may be that some people go into this and end up thinking, oh, I perhaps would like to do a PhD. And that does get you into a different way of thinking about research, so it's not straightforward. I think we have time uh, for two, at most three questions, so can I have um, two or three hands up quickly without, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Charlene, I'm from SGH. Um, you mentioned that uh, we shouldn't tightly define practice research um, because that could end up being too prescriptive, but in the absence of a strict definition, some of us who have never done practice research might find it very hard to um, go about doing it or even explain to our uh, agencies why we want to go about this or what this is about. Um, so could you say more about how we can use this um, principle practically and also perhaps give us some examples of definitions that have been too prescriptive and counterproductive in the end that you have seen uh, in your experience? Thank you, Charlene. Next question. Um, yeah, there's a hand up there. Ted. Hi, my name is Alice. I would like to um, uh, I would like to know more about the context where this interest in uh, practice research has evolved over the 10 years. So, so what is the context of this rise in interest? And do we have that condition in Singapore now? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alice. Um, last question. Uh, yes, Guan uh, Zhen. I think these two questions are really very big. So I'm not sure whether we can promise Guan Zhen to answer your question, but yeah, go ahead. Hi, hi. Uh, my Guan Zhen, yeah, you're a student. Um, I'd like to ask, um, um, is there a difference for practice research for agency purposes and for policy purposes? Like, let's say if an agency wants to feedback to, like, like um, comment on policies, would there be a difference in the kind of research? Thank you, Guan Zhen. Yeah. Such a question, is there a difference between Policy and practice was it, or did I not like, hear you? Um, right? Yeah, um, difference between practice research used for agency practice and practice research for policy uh, makers. Policy yeah, purposes. Purposes. Yeah. Um, okay, question. Um, 
Yeah, was I, should, should I have been a bit clearer in saying, well, don't, don't be prescriptive, but at least say something about what it's about. Um, I, I, I was trying to say something about that in that the first part of the lecture when I talked about practice-led and, and partnership, um, uh, standalone staged projects, uh, um, networked or, or, or not networked. It seems to me that um, practice research ought to, if you think of those as six different possibles, possibilities, I think practice research ought to have a mix of all of those. What I was trying to avoid was a situation where somebody might say, um, oh, I, I would like to do something, but I think it, for example, I need to do half of it this year, and then the second half next year. Um, I was trying to encourage the people that are behind this initiative and managing it, uh, that that shouldn't be thought, oh, that's not quite what we mean by practice research. So that's what I meant by encouraging a flexibility. Um, uh, the, um, um, uh, th th what I mean by being too, too prescriptive um, I is that kind of way of limiting it. Now, um, practice research, I think I would not go much further than saying um, practice research, um, e even though I encourage you to relate it to wider issues, uh, ought to be something which has a relatively direct implication for practice um, here in your agency and hopefully wider in Singapore. Um, now, that excludes quite a lot of kinds of research that might go on elsewhere. Um, but um, uh, th that, that's about all I would say. Um, if you were particularly interested um, in this, maybe email me because um, I, um, we, we have done in um, the most recent study um, a fairly careful analysis of the, the kinds of problems um, that um, practice researchers were dealing with. And uh, I could extract that kind of data, and, and that's not to say this is what it ought to be, but at least it would tell you this is the spread of kinds of questions and problems um, that, that they were trying to address. Okay? Um, the um, second question um, is um, the context of the um, growth of interest in practice research, and uh, does that context happen and take place in Singapore, I think was the question. I suspect that's a, this is a question I need to be careful answering. Uh, uh, um, um, but I, I think all I would say really is that um, um, practice research, you, you can, I think it is possible to detect the way in which interest in practice research has moved around the world. It started largely in the UK and in the Nordic countries. And that's where still quite a lot of the thinking work is being done. Uh, Lars Iyahu is in Denmark, of course, at Aalborg University. There are people in Helsinki still working about it. But um, there has gradually then been some interest in the States. Um, and practice research is rather different from the general approach to social work research that happens in the States. Uh, um, that's a huge generalization that uh, would take me till tomorrow to justify, but uh, it, I think it is true. Um, and, um, and then it has moved from there where there is now, uh, um, I think the, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, parts of Asia are the, if you like, the growth areas for interest in practice research. Um, the next big um, practice research conference is going to be in Australia. So still broadly, in, in your part of the world. Um, so, uh, and I think that is sufficient justification in itself to say um, that there is a, a, um, a sense of a growing interest um, in, in exploring what this might mean and what it might hold for us. And um, then finally, that very interesting um, question about um, um, practice research 
or research which um, practice research which has a, an implication for practice and research practice research which may have an implication for policy um, I confess that is a question I have not thought a great deal about and I think I ought to think about it um, that comes from when you get a question from somebody that you also meet every Monday night in a <laughs> class for three hours and um, knows what kinds of questions might make it difficult for me to answer. Uh, uh, um, but that is an interesting question. What I would say is that it relates to what I think is a very interesting general question. Because almost all of the thinking and writing about social policy and or social work policy and social work practice have been in the direction of how does policy feed down to and influence practice there's a huge amount of interesting work in that field there is um, some real interest at the moment in how might practice um, um, flow back to and influence policy um, in one of the other things I do, I'm jointly editing a new book series for the European Social Work Research Association and we've just contracted for a book which is going to be dealing with exactly um, that question. Um, and uh, <coughs> So I think there is an interesting just beginning awareness um, that there ought to be ways in which practitioners can do things, say things, think through things, which speaks back to social policy. But that's as far as I can say. We have two more minutes. Um, unless your question is really very small, uh, it is hard to uh, make best use of the two minutes. Um, you would have uh, noticed that uh, Prof Shaw has this special talent of answering questions in a way that is deeper than you think your question is, right? <laughs> <laughs> so probably the way to learn from him is not the question and answer, but question, answer, and oh, actually, I didn't mean this, but now I begin to realize that I have more questions to ask. So a conversation and dialogue, perhaps. So... Um, uh, yeah, you're welcome to write him email as he has kindly given his email address. So please do that. And uh, with that, I think um, the MC would. Uh, do you want me to announce? So these are the opportunity also for you to have in-depth discussion with Prof Shaw. He's going to offer his time and expertise to uh, have clinics with people who are interested to come and uh, explore and discuss with him about your concept about practice uh, research or maybe something that you are brewing for some time already, how to uh, put it into concrete writing and maybe applying for the grants when the Li Chung Guan uh, Endowed Trust uh, Research Grant call comes about next May. Uh, so the, um, more details about how to uh, book these appointments with him will be available on uh, the department's website, so do look out for it. Is there anything else that I need to announce? Oh yes, so uh, MC also asked me to please request you to fill in the uh, green form uh, to help us know how to organize future public lecture better uh, for, for your benefit. So. Yeah, yeah, the tea uh, outside is still waiting for you, so please help uh, yourself to more tea. So with that, we thank you for coming to join us this Friday afternoon, and we wish you a very wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you.